you published a paper in 2016 along with Malcolm Perry and Stephen Hawking where you refuted John Wheeler and Bekenstein's claim that black holes are bald in nature. You you've implied that they are not like Tolstoy's happy families but they're like the unhappy families. They're all different. Right. And you've said in that paper that we found that black holes are not entirely bald. They can carry soft hair, low energy quantum excitations that might encode information about what fell in. So this seems to address both the black hole information paradox and the no hair theorem that we just spoke about. So let's dive into it. What is soft hair? And then how does it address these two mysteries or paradoxes that we just talked about? Okay, so first of all, um so soft hair So it's not quite tr- exactly true that um it's, it's it's not quite exactly true that um so it, it's a um it's a modification of Wheeler's observation already at the classical level so the one thing one might have said was well wait uh what about a black hole that's moving is that the same thing as a black hole that's still um and so there's a there's a subtle difference there and um and how do you how would you res- so of course everybody would want to say that a black hole that's moving um is different than a black hole that's not moving even if they have the same size and spin yeah even if they have the same size and spin right right okay, okay. however they're given by you have to add a little more structure to distinguish them you have to have sort of an observer which you would usually put out at infinity and um so i'm i'm putting something in which i'm trying to put something uh on which there is sort of half a century century a very precise and detailed mathematical work yeah. into simple words right. okay <laughs> no pressure <laughs> yeah <laughs> so the way that you would tell the difference between a moving black hole and a stationary black hole is you would have to have some structure at infinity moving relative to something right moving relative to some observers out at infinity that's how you that's how you would say it okay we have a re- we have a fixed reference frame now it turns out that it's very hard to so it's very hard to specify exactly how this reference frame works in einstein's general theory of relativity because um it because general general relativity is a theory in which space time itself it's an other theories like maxwell's theory of electromagnetism you fix the space time it's like fixing the blackboard and then you write the equations and everything moves around but you've got some some reference that you can yeah. pin everything against everything's emergent from that fundamental right? yeah every, everything's emergent from that that fundamental thing in general relativity you don't have that luxury because it's a theory of the blackboard itself and so you have to ask what is that relative to it what does it mean the black port the black hole is some uh curvature present on the blackboard what is it moving relative to okay so this turns out to be an incredibly subtle problem and was first realized by bondi metzner and sachs in the 
in the um, 60s and in different ways, by in a, in a very different way by Steve Weinberg in a completely different mathematical language, that um, the ambiguity in describing something, any object, not just a black hole, goes, it's not just whether something is stationary or moving, it, there's a lot more kinds of amb ambiguities. So one way of saying it is you have to ask how exactly the black hole is situated relative to infinity. And it's not just whether it's moving or not. There are infinitely many different parameters involved in a black hole attached to observers at infinity. It's the relativity principle. Yeah. Things are, everything is relative. What is the black hole relative to? Relative to infinity. And that actually gives us a number of very well-defined hair that we can associate uh, to a black hole. There are experimental predictions related to this hair, the so-called memory effect, mm -hmm. um, that uh, they're probably going to be probably going to be measured in the next uh, decade or so at LIGO or, or, or at LISA. And there's a very beautiful, beautiful mathematical story there. Now, this is going to explain the relevance um, to to black hole information, but let me just, uh, do you have any questions about what I said so far? Many questions, but let's complete the story. Why, I'll just drop a comment that while yeah. you were talking about fixing a reference point that's beyond the system, it reminds me of Gödel and Gödel's incompleteness theorem that you can't make predictions about a system while you're in it. So you have to have an external reference point or an observer to actually make predictions about something within the system. Am I making the right analogy? Um, it's not unrelated. Okay. It's not unrelated. Close. It's a, it's a theme. It's a theme in, 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 in physics that to be, there are often surprises when you dig down and try to be precise about exactly what you could observe or measure. It's not as simple as you thought. And of course, you know, it's of course, famously quantum mechanics. We can't measure what we thought we could, and, and here it's the opposite. There are more things that we can measure than 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 we thought, um, and so that um, gives that shows that uh, Wheeler was was subtly wrong. Um, and it is true, I mean, the theorems are mathematical theorems that uh, there is, is, is no hair, but they're not relevant to real world black holes in which we always uh, relate them to some observers at infinity. And then all of a sudden the situation is rather dramatically different. Now that's, that's the so-called that's the so soft hair on black holes. 